both equally as charming as their older brother and sister. All four have the marvelous qualities of children you can find in any school anywhere USA. Cleanliness, neatness, a dash of shyness, a sprinkle of playfulness, and an abundance of wholesomeness. They're bright-eyed, imaginative, but not necessarily typical of all children on the reservation. Can there be a typical family here? We think not. There are too many variances to consider. Would you ever suspect that the Lajeunet children live here? A one-room shack which offers very little, if anything, in the way of protection from hard northern Minnesota winters, not to mention the lack of running water and crowded conditions for a family of nine. Yes, there are seven children in the Lajeunet's family. It's difficult to visualize that anyone living in this kind of environment would have the initiative or desire, or indeed the means and opportunity, to send their children off to a fine school with scrub faces and clean clothes. But it's being done. And for Mr. and Mrs. Lajeunet, that's still not enough. Their individual initiative, a new job, and a loan from the tribe's own credit fund. The family moved into a newly constructed home this spring, and the ugly shack is just a bitter memory. And this story is not an isolated one. Similar accomplishments have been recorded time and time again in the past several years. The Red Lake Chippewas are on the warpath, and their number one enemy, poverty, is in danger. Our purpose in bringing you this program is to dispel some of the fallacies that have innocently been applied to the reservation and to bring Minnesotans up to date on the revolution, the industrial and social revolution currently taking place here. Red Lake, a reservation revolution. You are watching a special half-hour documentary filmed recently on location at the Red Lake Indian Reservation. This special program is brought to you by Naylor Electric, Beltrami Electric, the First National Bank, and the J.C. Penney Company, all of Bemidji. Now, Red Lake, a reservation revolution with John Hoven. The Red Lake Band of Chippewa Indians didn't acquire the land they have now without bloodshed. The Chippewas moved into the between rival Indian factions took place in 1849. These fights occurred in the vicinity of Cass Lake and Leech Lake, which resulted in the last withdrawal of the Sioux southward and westward. By 1860, these mighty warriors had conquered and occupied well over 10 million acres in northern Minnesota and North Dakota. But through a series of treaties between 1863 and 1904, all but about 630,000 acres in scattered tracts of land extending up to the Canadian border, including 90% of the northwest angle. The total area owned is about the size of the state of Rhode Island. Included in the acreage are the upper and lower Red Lakes, reputed to be the largest body of fresh water within any one state in the United States. It's theirs, and theirs alone, with the exception of the northeast corner of Upper Red, which lies outside the reservation boundary. Only resident Indians can use these waters. It's the source of not only food, but also revenue for those who uh, still enjoy reliving the past, all ceremonial, of course. The singer here, Otto Thunder, was a student at Carlisle University from 1912 to 1915 and a classmate of Jim Thorpe, the All-American football player. Unlike most Indian reservations, Red Lake is a closed reservation. That is, all the land is communally owned by the Red Lake Band, with title held in trust by the U.S. government. By comparison, all other Minnesota reservations, and most of them in the country for that matter, are owned by individuals who have had their right, and unfortunately many of them have throughout the years. This explains why most reservations are sprinkled with an abundant supply of white people. Red Lake Band members cannot sell land because, as individuals, they don't own any. They own the land in common. Members make application for, and are subsequently granted, land use permits for home sites and agricultural purposes. In order to qualify for reservation privileges afforded members of the tribe, one must have a minimum of one-fourth Red Lake Indian blood and be duly enrolled as a member of the band. 
There are presently more than 4,700 tribe members, of whom about 3,400 actually live here. The reservation is governed primarily by an 11-man tribal council whose members are elected to a four-year term of office. This is a recent change from the old chief system and has resulted in vigorous and renewed efforts in economically upgrading the lives of the people whom they serve. Council chairman is 54-year-old Roger Jourdain, presently serving his third four-year term. His is a demanding administrative job which pays $12,000 a year, paid solely from the tribe's own funds. Secretary of the tribe is 41-year-old Royce Graves, whose father and grandfather held high posts on the old chief council for more than 40 years. And treasurer is Francis Brunn, a 31-year-old former high school athlete who's in his first year of comfortable margin. Who, from each of four areas, Redby, Red Lake, Ponina, and a small settlement called Little Rock. The council is the legislative body of the band and operates under a constitution and bylaws approved by the Secretary of the Interior. The superintendent of the reservation is the Bureau of Indian Affairs line officer. At Red Lake, the supervisor is Reginald Miller, a 27-year veteran with the Bureau, whose primary responsibility lies in the overall administration of activities and programs on the reservation. The BIA agency at Red Lake employs 35 full-time people, many of them Indians. In all, 11 departments are intertwined here, including those of law and order, social services, forestry, agricultural extension, and accounting and credit. Which brings us to the question, where does the money on the reservation come from? Well, the Tribal Council and the Bureau of Indian Affairs are engaged in a determined drive toward economic development and full utilization of the vast reservation resources and other potentials in an effort to offer greater job opportunities and services to all of the members here. Great strides have been made during the past several years uh, covering a wide range of programs, all designed toward the achievement of full economic stability and independence for the Red Lake people. But that goal still lies at the end of a long, long road. The backbone of the Indian economy here used to be, and will be again, the Red Lake Indian Mills. And although operating in the red for the last half dozen years or so, for reasons I'll explain later, millions of dollars in profits have been realized through its operation in the past. The big stands of Norway and white pine on the reservation have been depleted over the years, and to help establish a new market in hardwoods, the tribe erected a new automated band saw back in 1963 to replace the old uh, steam mill. However, the facility burned to the ground. Now, they're in the process of building another new one. The assistant manager of the mills is Orville Kerb, a non-Indian paid from tribal funds. He explains the mills' problems, frustrations, and future. And we'll employ uh, close to 60, 65 men when we're in full production in, in the planer and hardwood shipping. We plan on leaving the little sawmill running uh, part of the time after the, the, the big one is going to develop an inventory to work from. Our inventory has been pretty well depleted. Our common labor starts off at 161 and it goes up to as high as 375 for the, the uh, mill foreman and filer. Our, uh, our truck drivers get uh, 189, our sawyer is two, two and a half, and it's uh, broken down for each different job uh, throughout the mill. Um, uh, most of our lumber is sold in the mid upper Midwest. However, we have accounts as far east as North Carolina. In fact, we set our budget up and have it approved by the tribe, and that this particular time was 700 and some odd thousand dollars, almost a three-quarters of a million dollar operation. The operation now is more or less of a, a salvage operation. We are going into hardwood for the first time, well, with the advent of these new mills. It's not, uh, it's not any heavy stand of timber of any kind in any one place like it used to be. You could go cut pine maybe for a, for a winter or two and in one area. That's not the case anymore and we are cutting hardwood all, in all parts of the reservation, bringing in scattered pine from all parts. Redby, the second largest village on the reservation and the only place within the boundaries that has some taxable land under private ownership by non-Indians. The village was incorporated in 1905 and was opened to settlement during the logging days when the railroad entered the reservation for that purpose. The only theater located here. The movies are changed on a regular basis, usually low-budget type action pictures and usually double feature presentations. 
In addition to the mill, Red Lake Fisheries Association is also located in Redby. As the mill, the fisheries is also a main source of revenue for the tribe. It's possible for a family with all members participating to earn up to $6,000 a season if they are hard workers. But the average income is down to about $1,500. However, that's gross and net profit as tribe members do not pay taxes on income derived from natural resources on the reservation. The fisheries, which is a cooperative set up under state statutes, pays participating fishermen every two weeks, and any profits realized at the end of the year are distributed on a patronage basis, a fish bonus it's called here. Inactive at the time we visited the facility, the fishery spills over with activity during the season. The majority of fish, and there are some 650,000 pounds of walleye taken out of a harvest of one and a half million pounds a year, is shipped to markets out of state, mostly to Chicago. While the Indians living here can legally fish any time of the year except during the spawning season, the fisheries co-op season set by federal regulations is reached. The Indians have prohibited sport fishing on the Red Lakes in efforts to preserve this important commercial fishing industry. Leaving Redby and continuing on around the lake for 25 miles, we head for the third Indian village called Pornima, the oldest and most primitive of the three villages on the reservation. All main roads, incidentally, are hard surfaced. This, combined with the scenic beauty of the area, plus the wild frontier style of living, makes for a most interesting contrast. Ponema had long been as we were able to settle in their midst until 1928. It now has an elementary school and serves about 100 students. The high school children are transported to Red Lake, and we'll visit that facility a bit later. Dan Raincloud, whose son sits on the council as a Ponema representative, takes pride in considering himself as the only Republican on the reservation. And it may or may not be a coincidence, but the wording on the shirt he wears has some bearing on a title he holds as chairman of the Reservation Credit Committee. Raincloud is the tribe's last practicing medicine man. He still dabbles in the trade occasionally and conducts traditional funerals and other ceremonies. It's here in the Punima area where the non-Christians still bury their dead in the old manner. The miniature hut-like shelters are constructed on top of the graves to provide housing for the spirits. Special food for the spirits is prepared and dropped through small triangular holes in the walls, a ritual they compare with placing flower wreaths next to tombstones in Christian cemeteries. Unlike monuments as we know them, these huts are not designed to last forever. No further maintenance is done after construction, and when they collapse with age, the spirits inside do too. The majority of the Indians here, however, are Christians, and Catholic is the predominant religion, about 60%. Lutherans and Episcopalians share most of the balance. There are also a Church of Christ and the Northern Gospel on the reservation. The Mormons have tried to get something going, but troubles developed, and they were eventually ordered off the land. There's been a Catholic church on the reservation for more than 100 years. It's St. Mary's School and Mission, operated by the Benedictine Order of St. John's in Collegeville, Minnesota. Father Cassian runs the mission with the help of 12 Benedictine sisters from St. Joseph. Their elementary school of grades 1 through 8 boasts an enrollment of over 200 students. Father Cassian has lived here for more than 10 years now. During that time, he has seen much material progress on the reservation, but he admits that spiritually and morally, the residents here have changed very little. Although most tribe members claim to be Catholic, Father Cassian joins together only about five couples a year in marriage. Justices of the peace usually get that business. Father Cassius, as all others we talked with at Red Lake, cited the many fallacies that persist in the neighboring areas. The most widely publicized misconception, perhaps, is that all Indians here receive a monthly allotment check from the government. This, of course, is not true. Businessmen and store clerks and others will see these Indians cashing government checks in the various towns, but that represents money either earned from a government job on the reservation or perhaps it's a government claim payment. We mentioned earlier that the mill and fisheries make up the backbone of the economy, but the reservation has something else working for it. We refer to the various government programs and people which have flooded the area, including the Community Action Program, or CAP as it's called, administered by the Red Lake Tribe, with money furnished by the tribe and through the Office of Economic Opportunity. There are many critics of the OEO around the country, claiming that most of the millions of dollars being poured into the program go to those administering the program rather than to the poor themselves. Well, that may or may not be the case in many areas, but if OEO has been successful anywhere, it's been successful here. 
the Red Lake Community Action Program under the direction of the Tribal Council and supervised by Robert Troyer perhaps has done more for the Indian here than any other single program. It's the Home Builders Training Program which has really taken hold here. Not only does it provide comparatively high standard, low cost housing for tribe members, but also a substantial number of residents are acquiring skills which will enable them to find fruitful work on or off the reservation upon completion of this program. CAP Director Bob Troyer talks about it. Home Builders Training Program was the first of its kind anywhere in the country. It was a reservation's own idea. The tribal leadership came up with it, and the federal officials took a lot of convincing before they would approve it. The reservation proposed that 30 unemployed local residents who wanted training in any one of five construction trade skills, carpentry, plumbing, electricity, masonry, and sheet metal heating, be employed for a period of eight or nine months and under expert instruction and supervision taught the rudiments of these skills. In the process, these men would build 10 homes, homes which in quality could pass or surpass uh, any federal standards for housing construction. Once the houses are completed, uh, they are turned over to the reservation's own housing authority, either for rent or for purchase to local residents. Now, the monthly payments, whether the family is renting a home or buying it, are keyed to the family's income so that the payments are reasonable enough that the family can be expected to keep them up continuously and regularly each month. Of the 600 homes on the reservation, more than 500 of them are considered substandard. This home builders program is financed jointly by the government and the tribe itself, with $155,000 of Indian money used so far to pay for materials and instructor salaries. In addition, some 80 homes have been built by individuals on the reservation in the past several years. Members of the Red Lake Band of Chippewas can borrow money from their own tribal credit loan fund for this purpose. If the family earns $3,000 a year, and only 25% earn at least that much, they can borrow up to $5,000, all repaid, of course, at a low 4.5% interest. Lawrence Lajeunet borrowed money from the tribe to build his home. Construction started last fall on a site just in back of his old place. The excitement and anticipation of moving out of the one-room tar paper shack to a brand new home with indoor plumbing and a lot of space were very much in evidence then. Mrs. Lajeunet, 26 years old, and members of her family visited the building site several times a day. It was easy to understand why Mrs. Lajeunet was eager. The mere thought of living in a modern dwelling, she said, with all the conveniences it offers, jiggles my insides. Her husband, who spent four years in the Air Force, including one year in Korea, and who had a brother killed in Korea, had tried living with his family off the reservation following his district. Many other Indians, he could not adapt himself to city life and did not feel accepted by the white society. When his children reached school age, Lajeunet gave up the battle and returned to Red Lake. His first job, on return, paid him $1.77 an hour as a truck driver for the lumber mills. Last summer, Lajeunet applied and got a job here at the Red Lake Hospital, operated by the U.S. Department of Public Ambulance Driver, pays him $2.24 an hour, plus overtime. Lajeunet is doing all right, and he's the first to admit that he's got a good job. He's proud of his position as an able family provider and one of the few new homeowners on the reservation. His income is subject to federal and state income tax, but the reservation offers members a number of advantages, including free dental and health care, which more than offsets any paycheck deductions. There's no taxable property on the reservation to speak of. A school bond is never issued, but the Lajeunet children attend classes in modern school facilities. Red Lake is a fully accredited independent school district, the same as any other district off the reservation, operated by a locally elected school board. Without local taxes to support it, the school system is financed jointly by federal and state monies to the tune of about $675,000 a year. All teachers are employed by the local school district, and they have enjoyed a higher salary than teachers of comparable standing in surrounding areas. 
However, there's an isolation factor involved here, and it's been fun for the teachers to come. There are two elementary schools on the reservation, one in Ponema and one in Red Lake. However, the only high school is in the village of Red Lake, and all of those students living elsewhere are bused in daily. School superintendent is Jim Poissant, a University of North Dakota graduate, who with assistant Henry McNeil admits there are problems, not the least of which is space. Construction in this case is strictly the government's business, and school officials can only request and hope extra funds will be made available for that purpose. Attendance does average a relatively high 85%. However, the remaining 15% represents, for the most part, out-and-out -out truancy. And more often than not, children are truants with the blessing, or at the very least, a feeling of apathy on the part of the parents. The unwed mother problem seems to be no more or less than in many other school systems. Four girls dropped out of school last year, including a 14-year-old because of pregnancy. However, things are looking up in other departments. School officials have adopted a new code for students, and they are pleased with its compliance. Teachers have noticed a marked increase in personal hygiene and cleanliness. A favorite mode of dress by boys, for instance, long hair and white dress shirts hanging down outside their blue jeans is gone. A modern school, modern facilities, modern teachers, modern transportation, but still extremely non-modern housing for the overwhelming majority. Operating under the Community Action Program is Operation Head Start. That's the recently activated government preschool program for little children from poverty areas. Head Start, under the direction of Lewis Tatter, represents the largest single money outlay in CAP's long list of various programs. $140,000 federal grant was issued for the first nine-month period, and an additional $202,000 was allocated for the following 12-month program. Not everyone in the country agrees with the Head Start idea, with opponents saying that it's just a waste of money. Perhaps the whole war on poverty can be administered more efficiently. Most big businesses can. But from our observations at the Red Lake facility, the Head Start program, with some 240 preschoolers enrolled, plays a vital role in the overall social revolution on the reservation. Granted, while some mothers actively participate and help administer the program, there are others who consider Head Start as just a convenient babysitter. But regardless of parental feelings, the children involved are not only helped, but they're given a free hot noon meal as well, a meal many of them wouldn't get otherwise. Red Lake Cafe store operators, Mr. and Mrs. Ray Roberts, whose business is burglarized, an average of six to seven times a year, are among those cautiously critical of the reservation police department. All they do is look for drunks, they claim, but vandals are hard to find. The police department certainly is not lacking for equipment. It has a paddy wagon, a rescue wagon, five squad cars, a jeep, and a police boat. The department is headed by Matt Sayers, a 13-year veteran on the force. It's illegal to have liquor of any kind on the reservation, but Chief Sayers says that doesn't deter anyone who wants to drink. By far, drunk and disorderly is the most consistent charge issued, and usually it's to the same offenders four or five times a month. An average of 20 juveniles a month are tried for drinking and malicious mischief. The youngsters buy bootlegged 40-cent wine for a dollar, but so far it's been much easier to find the youths than the bootleggers. Chief Sayers has the help of six other officers, including a woman, Joyce Oliver, who's been on the force for five years. Their jurisdiction applies only to crimes committed by Indians on the reservation. Minor cases are tried in their own Court of Indian Offenses, with an appointed Indian judge assigned to hear those cases. Red Lake Reservation Police can apprehend and hold a white man on the reservation for an offense but must release him as soon as possible to authorities off the reservation. Conversely, states or county authorities have no jurisdiction here on the reservation. It's Indian land held in trust by the federal government, so federal authorities are called in for any major crimes which are committed within the reservation boundaries. But any Indian committing a violation off the reservation is fair game for any law enforcement agent and is treated and tried without regard to color. Porter was learning there are very productive farms in the reservation. There aren't many to be sure, only 11 to be exact, and all of them are located in this area, in the northwestern corner, some 45 miles from Red Lake Village. 
The land in this area is excellent. 100 bushels to the acre is the rule, which is above the state average. The farm we visited is located just on the edge of the reservation, only 10 miles from Goodrich, Minnesota, 30 miles east of Thief River Falls. 40-year-old Bernard Wells, who is visited frequently by Red Lake's extension agent, Floyd Jurgensen, farms 640 acres, land loaned to him by the tribe. In return, the tribe gets one-fourth of the profits, and there are profits. Wells is the only grade A dairy farmer east of Goodrich, and four years ago was chosen by an young farmer. Members of the Wells family, of course, enjoy all the privileges as enrolled members of the tribe. They can fish and hunt any game, any time of the year, by any method they choose. And, of course, because it's reservation land, Wells pays no personal property or income taxes. His children attend school off the reservation at nearby Goodrich. It's more convenient and less expensive for the tribe to make those arrangements than bust the students the 45 miles every day to Red Lake Village. Father Cassius says that an Indian lives from day to day and has no long-range goals. That's probably the rule, but there are exceptions. Indian culture has been slow to develop, that's quite obvious. But too often, by too many people living off their reservation, the Indians are judged by white man's standards, and this is not fair. In their own way, they've accomplished a great deal. Perhaps the formation of the reservation's own newspaper last summer is indicative of what's going on here. Six young tribe members are involved in editing the reservation news. Whether a community get-together or a fatal accident or a robbery, these reporters find out and print the facts. It is not a propaganda organ, but a vital and worthwhile communication, the first of its kind here since the early logging days near the turn of the century. The news, distributed free, has a weekly circulation of more than 1,200. While there are exceptions, just as there are in any society, tribal members of the Red Lake Band of Chippewa Indians are, by and large, not sitting back with the attitude that the country owes them a living. Our country indeed owes them something, and our efforts to help the tribe should not go unnoticed by you, by me, or by the Indian himself. Red Lake, with its closed reservation, local government control, and a growing desire for economic stability, is far from reaching the point of being 100% self-sustaining, the welfare rules still include the names of many Red Lake people. But it should not go unrecorded that Red Lake and most of its inhabitants are at least learning that there is a difference between living and existing. True, there are individual exceptions and many problems, but if it wasn't for the Indians' increasing degree of self-determination and pride, if it wasn't for a desire to grow and prosper, then our job of helping solve those problems would be insurmountable. It's important that Minnesota its poverty, its riches, and its desires. Point of phrase, there are Indians and there are Indians. If you have seen one, you have not seen them all. Help those who help themselves. The Red Lake Band of Chippewa Indians is proving that in this instance anyway, this kind of approach in fighting poverty really works. This is John Hoven reporting from the Red Lake Indian Reservation in northern Minnesota. Red Lake, a reservation revolution, the first national bank, and the J.C. Penney Company of Bemidji. Red Lake, a reservation revolution, was a special documentary presentation of this station, film 